got authority this morning. We found that we have authority. I want you to stand right back up with me really quick. There's authority to dispatch angels. And what I want you to do is I want you to take authority and dispatch angels this morning to work on your behalf. To work in your situation, to work in your, to work in your circumstance. And say, God, right now, in the name of Jesus. I just dispatch angels. Come on. I dispatch the angels of heaven to come and to do spiritual warfare on my behalf. To do warfare on behalf of this church, on behalf of this city. God, we dispatch angels right now to do the work of the Lord here on earth as it is in heaven in Jesus' name. God, we thank you for the authority that you've given us. And God, we thank you that you've sent angels today, God, to do the work. God, that needs to be done. God, to go where we can't go and do what we cannot do in this very hour and to bring the victory in Jesus' name. Amen. Now can we just praise God for what he's done?
but I did find 40 uh, that are directly involved with the fear of the Lord. And many of the 40, I could probably give you multiple scriptures. I think uh, the minimal was 14 scriptures to support each and every one of them. Man, that's a cross-reference right there, right? Mm -hmm. So this one in particular, um, there's one passage in particular. It's in Psalms, um, and I'd like to, I, I call it the, the Holy Fear Psalm, okay? Because it actually has 10 of the benefits, well, actually 11 of the benefits right in one psalm, one psalm. And the first one is just a bonus. I, I, as I was reading it, I, I thought, well, how did I miss that one? But there's 11 here. 11. So we're going to do, we're going to, I'm going to do my best. I'm going to move quickly. <clears throat> so just track with me this morning. Psalm 112, Psalm 112, verses 1 and 3, and then verses 6 through 9. It says, praise the Lord. How joyful, how joyful. And there's one of the benefits, the person that fears God. The person that fears God is joyful. Do I got any joyful people in the house this morning? <laughs> Yes, how joyful are those who fear the Lord and delight in obeying his commands. Their children will be successful everywhere. <laughs> An entire generation of godly people will be blessed. Amen. They themselves will be wealthy. And their good deeds will last forever. Such people will not be overcome by evil, and they will be long remembered. Oh, this is good, isn't it? Yes, amen. And they, they do not fear bad news. Amen. The good news is the bad news is wrong. Amen. They confidently trust in the Lord to care for them. They are confident and fearless and can face their foes triumphantly. They will have influence and honor. Amen. Whoa. Eleven promises right here in Scripture. One chapter. Eleven promises. Just a few verses. Now let's walk through those promises together. Let's go through number one. The person who fears God, this person has successful children. Yes. Amen. Amen. Speak life over your children. In Genesis, God makes a statement to Abraham after Abraham puts down the knife where he was going to offer up Isaac. The angel then says, and this is God speaking through the angel, blessings, I will bless you. And in multiplying, I will multiply your descendants and your descendants shall possess the gates of their enemies. Yes. Yes. Amen. Your children will possess the gates of their enemy. That's what he told him. In other words, your descendants are going to be successful over those who hate me, God says. Hate me referring to God. Now, I was confused by this at first. Blessings, I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply to you. I, I went to the original text, and sure enough, uh, that's exactly the way it reads. Um, so why does it read in that manner? I will bless you. He seems, when he says, I will bless you and I will bless you, he seems to repeat himself. What is that all about? But in order to understand that, we have to have an understanding like a Jewish understanding. When you have a double reference like this, it's all about multiplying. And because one verb tense is present tense and the other verb tense is future tense, it's described as one of the blessings on Father Abraham. But God is also promising at the same time there's going to be Blessings on his descendants. Come on. Come on. Blessings, I will bless you. Yes. Blessings, and I will bless you. Yes. He's talking about us. Hello. Amen. Come on. Amen. I will bless you. So, in other words, if you look at Abraham, God was saying to him, You're not only going to be blessed now, but you're going to be blessed through your descendants, through your descendants. Solomon and Hezekiah and Isaiah yes. and even yes. Jesus. Yes. yes. There you go. Come God is now. saying Come when on, you Pastor. have Come holy on. fear, you're going to continue to be blessed throughout all of eternity. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. Promise number two. God says the person who fears me will be wealthy. Amen. Now I've studied and I studied that. Right? <laughs> that word. Wealthy. 
The Hebrew word for wealth means possessions, cattle, land, and farms. But I'd like to add this. The gospel is not about benefiting ourselves. True wealth is not about how much material possessions you have. Listen, it's how much you can influence others with what you have been given. Yes. 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 That's true wealth. Yes, we need resources in the world, and we must have them to operate. Because God did not call us to operate from a, a mindset of lack, but from a mindset of abundance. How many of you know you are abundantly blessed? Coming in and going out in every day, in every way, you are blessed. Say, I am blessed. I am blessed. Woo! There used to be an old song, I am blessed. I am blessed. walk around singing, I am blessed. Remind herself, it didn't matter what was in the checking account. It didn't matter if the car was broke down. It didn't matter if the wash machine wasn't working. She would walk around singing, I am blessed. Yes. Right. You are blessed this morning. Yeah. And God does not want us to have a poverty mindset. Amen. You are his children and you lack nothing. And we could never transform the world one life at a time with the mindset that godliness and poverty are synonymous. Amen. Listen, no, God says the person that fears me will be wealthy. It doesn't say he's going to heap up wealth upon himself. He wants you to be a conduit through which he can flow through you. If he can get it to you, he wants to get it through you. Amen. Right? So he, it can get to others. True wealth is not about you. It is about others. Yeah, right. Amen. Yeah. Promise number three. The person that fears God, God says, the good things this person does will last forever. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. You know, the other day somebody said to me, you know, it sure is going to be amazing when, when we start eternity. And I turned around and I looked at them and I said, oh, no, no. Eternity has already started. Yeah. Eternity has already started. The day you were born again, our eternal history started being written right then and there. Yeah. Yes. Now, for the sinner, that's not true because Ecclesiastes says this. Everything they do, loving, hating, their prosperity will be forgotten. Yeah. But for the believer, for the saint, turn to somebody and give them your true identity and say, I'm a saint. I'm a saint. I'm a saint. I'm a saint. <laughs> I'm a saint. Everything we do now is a part of eternal history. So everything you do, it's going to be remembered forever. Amen. Oh, that's good. Everything you do is going to be remembered forever. I didn't say everybody was going to talk about it when you die. It'll be remembered. It's being recorded. It's going to be remembered forever. Amen. Promise number four. The person who fears God, this person will not be overcome by evil. Mm, that's good. It doesn't matter what the enemy's been throwing at you. You cannot, you will not be overcome by evil. Amen. That is a promise of God. So let's stop and talk about it for just a moment. The promises and the blessings and the benefits of God have to be, a, be acquired by faith. And if you look at God, and God said, when God said to Abraham, he said, hey, it's through Isaac the nations are going to come. So God picks out Isaac's wife, Rebecca, through Abraham's servant. And when she comes to Isaac, they get married and they find out that she's barren, that she cannot have children. The Bible actually says in Genesis that Isaac had to cry out to the Lord. Everybody say, cry out. Cry out. He had to cry out to the Lord, and the Lord heard his cry yeah. yes. and opened her womb. Yes. 
So that blessing of having the nation come through Isaac was not automatic. He had to contend for it in the faith. Come on now. Yes. Come on. There are some things that you're going to have to contend for in the faith. Come on. You're going to have to put your foot out over the ledge, not knowing if there's going to be somewhere to step. Come on. Yeah. Come on. God's saying, if you do, I will honor you. I will honor you. Yes. Yep. Yet cry out to me and I will hear you. Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. Number five, the person who fears God will be long remembered. Will be long remembered. I love this one because it deals with our descendants again. Do you think descendants are important to God? Yeah. Yes. Do you think generations are important to God? If you look at verse 2, it says an entire generation of godly people will be blessed. The word generation simply means this, a long, long time. Mm -hmm. If you look at what Zechariah prophesied when he saw Jesus, he said his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. Yes. His mercy is on those who fear him from this generation to this generation to that generation to that. Wow, so good, right? Yes. So there's a generational thing here. There's a generational blessing. And I could sit right here and talk about this the entire lesson because there's so much to unpack here, but I can't. However, there is something that happened in the 1800s that I think is worth noting. There was a sociologist by the name of Richard Dugdale, and he visited 13 county jails in upstate New York, and he discovered six people in these 13 county jails with four different family names that were all related to one another. Now this sparked a curiosity and he started researching these men's histories. Their genealogies and he traced it back to one Dutch settler whose name was Max Jukes. He was born in seven, between 1720 and 1740, somewhere around in there. This man, Max Jukes, was an evil man he was not a good man. He was not a godly man. But they found 540 of his descendants. And here's what they found out about his 540 descendants. 76 were convicted criminals. 18 were brothel housekeepers. 120 of them were prostitutes. And 200 of them were living on government relief and were recipients of that. Now there was another man that was born about the same time as Max Jukes. And his name was Jonathan Edwards. Oh, yeah. He was a man of God. He was the one who very famously was known for his sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Anybody ever heard of that one? Yeah. yeah. Okay. He was married to his wife, Sarah Pierpoint, in 1727. Uh, they had 11 children. And they greatly fear God. Eleven children, you have to fear God. <laughs> Eleven children. Come on. And every single day, he and Sarah read the scriptures together with their children. Every single day, they laid hands on their children and prayed for them. And Jonathan Edwards made this statement. Ed, he said, every house should be a small church. Do it well. Amen. Praise Amen. the Lord. Praise the Lord. Every house. Should be a small church. Do it well. And they were able to trace the descendants of Jonathan Edwards, which they were able to find 1,394 descendants. There's much more life there, huh? Yes. Much more than Max Jukes, who only had 540. But of the 1,394 descendants, listen to this. Of Jonathan Edwards, 13 of them were college or university presidents. 65 of them were university professors. Three of them were United States senators. 30 of them were judges. 100 of them were lawyers. 60 of them were physicians. 75 of them were army and navy officers. 100 of them were uh, ministers and missionaries. 60 of them were authors of, of great prominence. And one of them was the vice president of the United States by the name of Aaron Burr. Wow. What a contrast. Yes. Yes. Look at the person who fears God. They're going to be long remembered. We definitely remember Jonathan Edwards. 
But I doubt anyone has ever heard of Max Jukes in the room. Yeah. That's right. That's yeah. right. Long remembered. Number six, the person that fears God will not fear bad news. That's right. That's right. That's right. Amen. You don't have to fear bad news. Why? Because you can choose to believe the report of the Lord instead. Amen. 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 You know what Jesus said would happen right in the days before he would return, right? He said men's hearts would be failing them from fear and expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. Guess what? The fear of God is what pushes away all other fears. Amen. Yeah. When you fear God, all other fears have been trumped. Just like that. You now walk in peace, in security, and in confidence that others don't have because you don't have to fear bad news. We can walk out of here and receive some terrible news, but we don't have to fear it. Oh, back in 2019, we received some pretty bad news about our daughter, right? Received some pretty bad news, but I knew I did not have to fear it. Because my confidence was not in everyone else who was in him. Yeah. He who promised. Yes. I judged he who promised to be faithful. Yes. He's faithful this yes. morning. Yes. He's faithful. It doesn't matter what the government says. It doesn't matter what the government does or does not do. It doesn't matter what the news says. It doesn't matter what social media says. Your heart safely trusts in God because you don't fear those who can kill the body and afterwards can do nothing to the soul. You fear him who after death can catch the soul and the body into hell. That's, right. That's who we fear this morning. Listen, Jesus isn't saying to be scared of God. He's actually talking about this healthy Holy, reverent fear that his presence brings to our life. Yes. Oswald Chamber made this statement. This is remarkable. It says this. The remarkable thing about God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Amen. Right. Amen. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. Mm-hmm. I love that statement. Do you want to know why anxiety and and depression is at an all-time high in our society. It's because we quit teaching on the fear of the Lord. Come on. Come on. It's because we lack the fear of the Lord. Listen, people who have the fear of the Lord are anxious. Be anxious for nothing. How can he say be anxious for nothing? He can say be anxious for nothing simply because the fear of the Lord is present in your life. And you know who's your champion this morning. Yeah. You know that yeah. he's already Come won on the on victory. Now. And all you have Glory. to do is stand there and declare the victory. Glory. He brought the enemy's head back and called your victory. Praise God. Praise God. Woo. Woo. I love that statement. Yeah. Amen. Number seven, the person who fears God is confident. God said to Joshua seven times, be strong and be of good courage. What's the opposite of courage? Put a dis in front of it. Discouraged. When you fear God, you don't have to be discouraged. You can choose. Everybody say you can choose. You can choose. And you can say, I'm going to choose to be discouraged and I'm just going to complain. And guess what? The minute you begin to, to get discouraged and you start complaining, you've just walked out of the fear of the Lord. Yes. 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 Because God said, you know what complaining says to me, right? Complaining says to God, I don't like what you're doing in my life. And if I were you, I would be doing it totally different, most definitely. This is the very activity that kept the children of Israel from their destiny, and it was complaining. That's right. That's exactly right. Complaining. Can I just tell you that this series has kicked my rear end more than you could even imagine, right? I have found myself with less and less things to say out loud, especially. 
I notice my mouth isn't as tired. <laughs> mm -hmm. Israel had five sins. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 7 through 10, it says one of them was idolatry. One of them was immorality. The other one was tempting Christ. And the other one was eating any things that had been sacrificed to idols. And then you got complaining. Yeah. Yes. A sin. I didn't write it. It's in there, though. Right there. As I was reading, I said, God, what is up with this? What do you mean complaining is on the list? Right? I'm complaining about the list. Right? And God says, complaining is, very, is a very serious sin to me. And if you look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, it says, it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Therefore, do all things without complaining. And you know what he just said, right? He just said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. The fear of the Lord delivers you from complaining. It makes you confident. It makes you strong. And it makes you have good courage. Listen, people that fear God are confident. They are leaders. They, they know that they are the head and not the tail. They have nothing to complain about. They know that they are above and not beneath. They have nothing to complain about. That's the person that fears God. Number eight, the person who fears God is fearless. Fearless. Ephraim, the Syrian, he wrote this. Whoever fears God stands above all manner of fear. That person becomes fearless. I have an example of this. There was a pastor in the 1970s who was up speaking and after service, a man had joined them that did not normally attend the congregation. He was from out of town. He came in, he sat on the back row and after service, the pastor talked to him for just a moment. He said, Pastor, I'm here with a message I, I pulled off the interstate, and I am here with a message from the Lord to you. And he told the pastor, he said, God has given you advance warning that somebody's going to try to take your life. He said, but this is the instruction. This is what the Lord says. Just stand and be confident. Just stand and be confident. Sure enough, about three months later, a man with a 38 revolver came in the back door of the church, came straight up the, the, the aisle of the sanctuary, and he shot off six rounds. All six rounds missed the pastor. Of course, the man was arrested, but the forensics leaders came in, and they said three of the shots missed by six inches to the left and then six inches to the right. The man did not budge. The pastor did not move. He just stood confidently while the man unloaded the entire gun. He did not duck. He did not get behind the pulpit. They said if he had ducked, had he moved in any way or tried to hide behind the pulpit, he would have been killed. God gave him advance notice. He must have been a friend of God. Right. Amen. <laughs> he must have been a friend of God for God to download such things to him, right? Yep. He was a man that feared God, and he stood there and did not move and was not killed. Now, I think that's amazing. Amen. Ooh, number 10. Here we are, finally. The person who fears God is the person who has honor. In other words... That person becomes a person of dignity. If you look at Proverbs 31, the Proverbs 31 woman, yes, it's about a woman, but there is a statement that is made that a lot of people miss, and it says her she clothes herself with dignity, honor. They are similar, right? Now, clothing is something you see, correct? I mean, you're looking at me, you look at my clothes this morning, my outfit this morning, right? So you see that, 
there's something that you notice. You would clearly notice if I walked in here with no garments on. <laughs> right? Yeah. So we clothe ourselves with good things, right? The Bible says you even do so spiritually. With dignity and honor. I walked into a room with many leaders older than I. And I, when I walked into the room, there's a sense of dignity and honor that these men carried, these women carried about themselves. I look at the great men and women of God that I've had the privilege of literally having them pray over my life. And I think dignity. There are specific men and women that I, I remember when I got in their presence, I felt like I was in the presence of a person with great honor and dignity. That's God's promise over your life. The person who fears him, he says, I'll honor them. Mm. I will honor them. But do you, want, do you know what? The Proverbs 31 woman earmark is. It's this charm is deceitful. Mm -hmm. Beauty is vain. Mm -hmm. But the woman who fears the Lord yes. shall be praised. Amen. 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 Ladies, can you get a hold of that? Don't sell yourself short of what God has for your life. There ain't no man worth it. Yes. Amen. Amen. The woman who fears the Lord shall be praised. I would rather hear his praise on that day Amen. than to hear some man wrap his arm around me and whisper his little sweet nothing to not mean a thing. That's right. That's right. Oh, I'm preaching. That's right. Yep. Amen. Come on. So in other words, the fear of the Lord is what clothes us with dignity and honor. Now I want to turn to the greatest benefit of all of the fear of the Lord, and that is wisdom. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7, getting wisdom is the most important thing that you can do. And it says, if you prize wisdom, in verse 8 actually, it says, he will make you great. If you prize wisdom, he will make you great. I love that. Now watch this. Wisdom must be discovered. Yeah. You've got to be looking for it. Wisdom must be discovered. It is hidden, but not out of reach. Oh, that's so good. Once found, it brings tremendous benefits. So how do we find it? Psalm one. Uh, 111 verse 10 and Proverbs 9 and 10, they both say the same thing. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, the beginning is a significant word. The Hebrew word is used is the same one in Genesis 1, 1 when it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The word beginning literally means starting place. So that's the starting place for wisdom, the fear of the Lord. That's where we start. So I want you to picture it like this. You've got a storehouse, and it is filled with wisdom. It is filled with understanding, and it is filled with knowledge. And that storehouse has got one door and one key, the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the key to that door that gets you into that storehouse. That's the starting place of wisdom. Listen to Isaiah 33, verse 6. This is the NIV. A rich storehouse of wisdom and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure. In other words, the fear of the Lord is the key to the treasure house. Yes. Amen. Mm -hmm. So holy fear, the origin of it is wisdom. The origin of holy fear is wisdom. But the benefit continues far beyond the starting place. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. 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 
If you look at Proverbs 14, verse 27, it says, The fear of the Lord is like a fountain of life to turn one away from the snares of death. Now, there's two words here I want to highlight. That's fountain and that's snares. Fountain in the Hebrew means a continuous flow. Snares means traps, right? Now, every hunter knows that you've got, in order to have a good trap, you have to have two things. And that's this. You've got to hide the trap well so that the animal does not see it. And the second thing is it has to be baited so it draws the animal in. So what the fear of the Lord does is protect you from those secret hidden traps of the devil. Come on. Come on. Come on. There is another verse of scripture in Proverbs 15 verse 33. And it says the fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom. So put the two verses together and the fear of the Lord is the continual flow like a fountain of life. Turning one away from the news of death. So it is a continual flow of what? It is a continual flow of counsel, of wisdom that protects you from the traps of the enemy in this life. So good. That's why Solomon said, this is man's all. Fear God and keep his commandments. When you can come up and help me if you want. The fear of God is to keep his commandments. How do we fear the Lord? Well, if you look at Proverbs chapter 2. Verses 3 through 5, the first thing you have is, and you have to do, is to cry out for it. You have to cry out for understanding and wisdom and knowledge. You have to search for them like silver and gold. I don't know if you guys have ever seen Gold Rush before. You ever seen those guys having to work to get that gold out of that dirt? And that's after they dig it out of the ground. And all the work that goes into that, that's searching. Right? Oh, it's just not like you just go in there and, you know, take your little pick and, oh, there's some gold there. <laughs> oh, no, no. You, you're going to see a whole lot more dirt before you see gold. There's got to be a whole lot more sifting going on for you to see the gold. Right? I've been on a quest to know more about the fear of the Lord. And each morning I cry out, God, fill me with the Holy Spirit of the fear of God. Now let me read this last thing here, Isaiah 11. You've heard me quote this all throughout this series, verses 1 through 3. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse. A branch shall grow out of its roots. This is talking about Jesus. It says, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Now listen to verse 3. And his delight was in the fear of the Lord. And his delight, Jesus' delight, was in the fear of the Lord. So the fear of the Lord is actually a manifestation of God's very own spirit. Right. Jesus makes this statement in Luke 11. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will you give him a stone? If they ask for a fish, would you give him a serpent? If they ask for an egg, would you give him a scorpion? If you then being evil know how to, good, know how to give good gifts to your children... How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Amen. Amen. Yes. All right. All we have to do is ask Him. Amen. Stand with me this morning because we're going to do some asking right now. (laughs) He's willing to give you His Spirit this morning to walk and live in all of these benefits, right? Who wants the gift of the Holy Spirit this morning? Oh, good, good. Yes, all right. Everybody wants the gift of the Holy Spirit. How many of you know your Father in Heaven, just like when Hayden or Harrison come to me and they ask me for something, nine times out of ten, I'm going to say, okay, yes, here's a good gift for you, right? 
he wants to give you the Holy Spirit this morning, the gift of the Holy Spirit. So let's prepare ourselves for that. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I want you to just get in a receiving position. Hold your hands out in front of you. Just get in a receiving position. Yep. I want you to pray with me. Say, Holy Spirit, I'm asking that you would come into my life and that you would pull out everything that is in the way that is not like you I give you full reign in my life and I ask that you would fill me with the baptism of the Holy Spirit now I ask that your Holy Spirit would be evident in my life through the spirit of the fear of God and prophecy and my prayer language make it evident that you are present here in this life in this heart in this place in the name of Jesus amen amen come on praise him now I'm just going to say this as you begin to praise God and as you begin to minister to the Lord and as you begin to get into song and as you begin to hear, maybe you're in your car and you're just listening to some praise music and all of a sudden, this language you don't understand begins to bubble up. Just go ahead and let him begin to speak. When you get down here or you get to, in the grocery store somewhere and all of a sudden you have this, this overwhelming feeling that this person next to you, even though I may not know you, but I feel like they just need to be encouraged. I'm going to encourage them. That's called prophecy. Yes. Okay? Yes. And we're going to prophesy into their life. That's yes. evidence that the Holy yes. Spirit is in your life. Yes. The next time you're tempted to do something that is not like him, you're going to be aware of his presence now because the Holy Spirit's here. So you're going to be aware of his presence. And you don't want to do anything to offend him. In any way. So what you're going to do out of that holy reverence, out of that holy fear, you're going to say, oh, that's not for me. Oh, and I'm going to turn up and walk away. That's evidence that the Holy Spirit is living on the inside. Come on. You know how it's evident that you have the Holy Spirit. There's three evidences right there. Yes. Right? Yes. So don't be surprised when he shows up. Amen. Because you invited him in. He's there already. Yes. Say, he's here already. Yes. yes. He's right there with you. Yes. And I'm so grateful, so grateful for his presence. And I'm thankful for the fear of the Lord this morning. Thank you for joining us for this series this week. Um, come back and be with us next week. I, God's got some awesome things he wants to say next week. And I cannot wait to hear what he has for this house. Bow your head with me. We're going to be dismissed in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for this opportunity to be in your house, to be in your presence. Now we ask, God, that you would take us from this place but not your sight. You bless our coming in and going out. Let everything we do and say bring glory and honor to your name. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. God bless you. We'll see you back here next Sunday.